Okay. I know we're behind, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, again, I'm Mark Hu Alexander, one of the board members, and I have the pleasure of introducing um, the first speaker of our second session. He doesn't really need much introduction, but I will anyway. Um, this is Dr. Paul Grimm. He's professor, um, professor, professor of pediatric nephrology at Stanford University, um, and also a physician at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Um, a valued member of the CRF SRB board and um, one of the top doctors in my list um, and also has the really wonderful way of bringing like humor and and joy to this topic, which is um, difficult for so many of us and explains things in a way that actually makes sense. So um, take it away, Dr. Grimm. Good. Oh, great. So it's really nice to be here and, and nice to see uh, the people, <laughs> bless you. <laughs> and it was really fun to come in late, late last night and see the pool swarming with all the kids. That was really wonderful. So uh, this is going to be some thoughts that I've uh, developed over uh, uh, the 20 years I've been seeing cystinosis patients uh, with regard to their medication management. And for the people who are new or don't know me, even though I'm a pediatrician, I used to be a rural family doctor in Saskatchewan, and so I do have roots in adult medicine, and patients I see in the clinic are also adults. I have people up to their 50s that come, which raises eyebrows in the children's waiting room. Okay, so when you talk to people who are living with cystinosis, whether the patient, the people afflicted themselves or their families, there's a real legacy of guilt and trauma. And a lot of this centers around the late diagnosis. The child had such troubles uh, and the doctors, the healthcare system couldn't figure it out. Many of these adults tell me about, they remember accusations, the mom was a bad mom. For some of them, there was child protective service involvement. Uh, some of them, as was mentioned earlier, they were told your child won't live much beyond age 10 or 15. So, you know, treat them specially, don't expect much. And so when you talk to adults living with cystinosis and their families, there's a lot of stuff that's buried and coming to the surface. But we need to also recognize that the treatment itself is toxic. And so when you look at the literature in the cancer world, they're the people that really understand this. And they're recognizing there's this whole area called time toxicity of cancer treatment. So when you look at the amount of time people spend in hospital, when you look at the amount of time people spend going to take medications, and this is this is uh, was lent to me by a, by a family. Look at this schedule. Every twenty minutes, every half hour, something is happening to this child, whether it's nutrition or this med or that med. When you think of the amount of time that you require. And when you think that time is our most precious commodity or gift or resource, and caring for a child with chronic disease requires time for all the different doctor visits, medication prepping and taking, lab testing, radiology, developmental testing, cognitive testing, therapy, speech, OT. No child can get perfect care. And it's toxic because parents suffer from the perspective of their relationship or their career. Oftentimes someone has to take a hiatus in their career or sleep or self-care. And siblings, for example, if your cystinosis child is the first child, do you are there any even born after that, right? Um, what about parental time devoted to the sibling? Extracurricular, do they get a chance to do soccer or volleyball? School help, you know, some of these kids say, oh yeah, I learned pretty fast, I need to do my homework myself, pets financial implications. So in the healthcare system, we talk about ethics and usually people think the ethical approach to patients is what's the best interest of the patient? But when you think about it, what if the cystinosis child has only a single parent who has to keep down two jobs just to keep a roof over their head and food on the table? Or both parents need to be working so they're unable to supervise the medication taking. Or maybe they live way out in some small town where there's no pediatric hospital, uh, they, so they have to travel and take time off for work. And then there's competing needs of other family members if there's 
parents, you know, other siblings with other issues. So the best interest standard at feeling guilty if I can't give my child perfect care is being thrown out. Best interest is ill-defined, inconsistently applied, unreasonably demanding, and failed to respect the family. So take a look. Say you have a patient who's one of four children and has a severe multisystem lysosomal storage disease. Standard therapy hasn't helped. And now they're offered some weekly infusions of Gorilla A's, which will improve the quality of life, but it's not covered by insurance. So by following the best interest standard, do you recommend that the child prioritize this therapy, go in debt, ignore the other kids, move to a different uh, prov province or state? No, we don't. The actual de facto standard that we care for patients with all sorts of chronic illnesses that in practice, we don't intervene when parental decisions are suboptimal, but only when they're bad enough to fall below some reasonable threshold of acceptability. So when we reject the best interest, the alternative is to focus on what's good enough. And that's becoming the standard for chronic illness, respecting the family. So what's good enough for this child at this time? So we talk about a minimum threshold or is there a certain level of care where that patient is actually getting significant harm? And so this may be different for different families. But the point is that most children do well with a good enough approach. So when you get a diagnosis of cystinosis and you go to the doctor and they're saying you should be on every drops every hour, you should be on this medicine, this medicine, this medicine, you should be two feeds and this and that. It's very difficult for families to do it all. And then there's this guilt which continues to be toxic. So if good enough is acceptable for society and law and other everyday medical situations, is it acceptable in cystinosis? And I say yes, good enough for now. So your situations change and sometimes your child changes. And sometimes what's important for now may be different in two years. So the rest of the talk is about giving back a little bit of time or quality of life uh, to the family in no specific order. Polyuria. So Children with cystinosis pee a ton. And in the United States, most children with cystinosis were not and are not treated with indomethacin. It used to be controversial because nephrologists feared that long-term indomethacin therapy might be toxic to the kidney. And that has now been pretty much proved not to be the case. If anything, it's only a tiny, potentially no toxicity. But by giving your preschooler your school-aged child into medicine, it markedly reduces the thirst, it markedly reduces the urine output, and it often allows you to really cut back on all the electrolyte supplementation. And in Europe, it's practically standard of care. Now, endomethacin has been used to treat or help children with cystinosis for more than 40 years, and this is a paper uh, uh, from uh, Guy's Hospital 40 years ago showing improvement in sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, and phosphate in a cystinosis patient who got endomethacin. We're not really sure how it works. And in this picture of the nephron, all of these different areas could potentially be affected. So I can't explain why it works, but I know that it does. And this is a study uh, where the first author was Dr. Emma, who spoke previously. And they looked at an international cohort of five decades of Europeans who got or didn't get in the methods. So out of 453 cystinotic children, about 43% had a significant period of time when they got into medicine to improve the quality of life. And the important thing is this line here. The patients that got into medicine treatment had no difference in the rate of kidney failure or the progression of kidney failure. So I truly believe it's safe and that can make a huge difference in quality of life. And we regularly have patients who are told to stop into medicine for other reasons and the urine output skyrockets and they definitely feel unwell. So this is really changing the standard of care in the United States. Now, indomethacin is not without problems. It can cause gastric irritation like ulcers and bleeding. Some uh, physicians will use Motrin. What I tend to prefer is the sustained release indomethacin. So it's only available in the U.S. in 75 milligram capsules. But I have families open the capsule because it's the beads are sustained release. And so then you can split them up into a quarter capsule or a third of a capsule or a half a capsule a day to get the endomethacin. And then because the beads are sustained release, they don't irritate the stomach. 
There's other medications called diuretics that can markedly reduce the urine output and harm it for electrolytes. And uh, these, this also has been known for 60 years in patients who have high urine output, and they're called thiazides. And chlorothiazide, hydrochlorothiazide are examples. And they've been reported in patients with cystinosis. So patients with renal tubular acidosis, uh, and this is back in the 1970s in in certain parts of the world, adding a little bit of a thiazide diuretic is routine to reduce the urine output and reduce the requirement for hydrochlorothiazide. And there's a, uh, a, a German physician, Dr. Uh, Hohenfellner, who uh, works in Munich and is putting together a paper on this, and she has treated dozens of patients with low doses of thiazides, once again, to improve the quality of life. Potassium. Many of the patients who have their made kidney function are taking large amounts of potassium supplementation. Potassium itself can be irritating to the stomach. I have a few patients where I have started them on a different diuretic, a potassium sparing diuretic called Milleride, and it has markedly reduced the potassium requirement in some of these patients. So initially, I was afraid to use it, and people have, have, have been concerned that it would markedly increase the polyuria, and so always seen, but that doesn't happen. And I have a number of patients who will testify that the potassium requirement dropped and everything else stayed the same with a little bit of the Milleride. So we're learning that we can play with these different medications to really help the quality of life of patients. Eye drops. So we all know about corneal crystals, which uh, develop and lead to a significant vision impairment. And this is a picture of a slit lamp exam with a tiny narrow beam of light. And all these, uh, really, oh, there it is. All this haziness in this cornea here is the crystals of cystinosis. And after a year or two of treatment with the drops, the crystals are gone. So we know that it's important to treat, uh, to save the vision with uh, drops. But when do you start? So. Go back to the time when your child was diagnosed with cystinosis. You know, they had been failing to thrive, vomiting, they were, they were losing weight. <clears throat> and you're given diet, maybe two feeds, all sorts of medication. And then people talked, oh, yeah, you need to take the drops. But there's really no good data on when you need to start. And what I tell people is, I don't give a rat's ass about your eyes for the first year or two. What I'm worried about is brain growth. So when you look at from that critical two years or three years from birth to by the time most people with cystic are, gender, are, are, are identified, I'm most importantly worried about getting nutrition and getting the electrolytes managed to see optimal brain, brain growth because the vast majority of brain growth is done by not by, by five years of age. Now, what about the drops? Are you losing ground if you wait? You don't want the child's eyes to turn into this. So this is a field of crystals, and this is an example of what a child with severe crystals would be seeing. It's looking like looking through a window on a freeway, which is all hazy. Well, that doesn't happen for a very long time. Light sensitivity or photophobia usually doesn't develop until age four and discomfort by age 10 with watering or squeezing eyes shut and glare. Currently, the recommendations are the Sisteran drops are FDA approved to be given every hour while awake. And many of you in this room recall as of being a child, your parents or you if you're a parent advocating with the school to get a school nurse or get someone to give them a drop throughout the school day. Now, um, sister drops recently approved are more viscous and they're recommended four times a day. They both contain a preservative, they both sting, and the tolerability varies by patient. But the reality is this recommendation to do the drops every hour is a gross overestimate of what is really needed. You talk to ophthalmologists who care for cystinosis patients, sister and dosed four times a day is probably all you need. And you don't lose anything by waiting a few years. So this was the original paper from Bill Gall, uh, published in 2000, looking at their history with sister and drops. They had patients from one year of age to 32 
who had never been on drops because this was when they when they first developed them. Between eight and three years of drops cleared everybody's cornea. So it didn't matter if they started at age one or if they started at age 30. So as long as there wasn't the scarring of the cornea, which you almost never see before 15 years, you could clear that cornea. So I take from this that at the time of diagnosis, when that child is a year and a half, they have only a few crystals in the periphery. It's a, almost a waste of time to start drops because you need to focus on nutrition, electrolytes, brain growth. And then when the child is stable, it's about three years of age, then you start working on the drops. Because uh, I really think that you have to pick your battles and you got to focus on, on what uh, you can do. The other thing, forget having them done at school. That identifies the kid as being different or strange. The data shows that Cisteran drops only sticks around in your tear fluid for five minutes. So you can get excellent crystal reduction by doing all the drops within one hour a day. So many patients like watch TV or, or they're, 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 they're settling down in the evening uh, after homework and they just put the drops in for every commercial. So if you're watching an hour of television, you know, every five or 10 minutes, you put in the drops, you get four or five doses, you're done. You don't have to spread them out. You don't have to just grow. There's no data that supports it. All of a sudden, it gives you a bit more free time. Now, Sista drops, it sticks around in the tear film. So if your kid can tolerate it, if you can tolerate it, probably all you only need is twice a day. And the best time to get the Sista drops is like right before you close your eyes. That's the best time because then it'll stick in the tear fluid for a lot longer period of time and do a good job of pulling those crystals out. Everybody's different, so some pe people might need five doses a day, some people might need four other sets of but definitely don't need that every hour, which is what the FDA, rec uh, FDA approval is. And so the sister ran representatives that you may talk to are mandated by law to tell you that, but it is not true. But it's not their fault. They have to follow the law. Okay, medication timing. What can I take together? Like, when you often start your, your, your infant with all these meds, giving small doses very frequently because they just don't tolerate large doses. But over time, as your time is getting bigger, you can mix doses because a lot of medications can live perfectly well in the same bottle. So bicarbonate, potassium, phosphate, citrate, prosisby, sodium citrate, potassium, and phosphate, all can coexist in the same bottle or same syringe. I used to say that you shouldn't put calcium and phosphate in the same bottle or the same milk. There are some uh, nephrologists from the UK who do that, and they they say their, their kids' bones are fine. So I'm not even sure about that anymore. I do know that prosisby should never be given with or around carbonate, like calcium carbonate or bicarbonate. And you don't want to take sodium citrate, which is a bit acidic, and give it at the same time as you're giving sodium bicarbonate, because that'll just turn into bubbles and burn. Many parents learn that you can mix a lot of these electrolytes in the water that the child drinks or in their formula. And if you if you do, you just start very low, but adding a little bit at a time, let the child get used to it, slowly work up on the electrolytes uh, to increase the amount. And some families put all of their electrolytes in the full day into the formula, shake it up. And so the child is getting it continuously whenever they feed. And especially if they're on nighttime, they feed the second to take. Bicarbonate. Many patients are on bicarbonate, and you know that if you take bicarbonate, some people do just fine, but a lot of people it causes burping and gastric distress. Bicarbonate pills bought from the pharmacy are expensive. You don't need pharmacy bought bicarbonate. Uh, many uh, physicians uh, counsel the patients about plain old Arm and Hammer baking soda, as long as it's measured properly and reliable. High insurance copay is a killer for vitamins, bicarbonate, citrate, and calcium because the insurance company says they're supplements, they're not medicines. But in the cystinosis population, they are medicines. So consider food sources. So for base, lemon juice can be an excellent source of base. And I've had two cystinosis patients that I met, and they were on no base supplements. I thought, how can you live like that? Why do you have normal bicarbonate levels without bicarbonate? without citrate, and it turned out they said, I love lemons. 
I eat a lemon or two a day? And that was the answer, because the lemon turns into citrate and the liver converts that into bicarbonate. If you are one of the people who pays a couple of hundred dollars a month for, for sodium citrate pills or sodium bicarbonate pills, just go to Amazon, go to the molecular gastronomy section, because this is food grade sodium citrate, which is citrate. And so you can get kilos for 20 bucks. And as long as you measure it carefully with an actual measuring equipment and work with your dietitian or your or your or your uh, physician, you can literally save hundred dollars, hundreds of dollars a month. Now, if you have good insurance and you're on bicarbonate, there's this. This is bicarbonate. It's enteric coated sodium bicarbonate pills. It passes through your stomach, goes into your small bowel. You don't have the burping. You don't have the stomach irritation. But it is kind of expensive. And only some insurance covers it, but that's available. So if you need to be on sodium bicarbonate, because that's what your doc wants, and you can't afford bicarbonate, you can make your own. So this is Amazon. These are enteric-coated vegan gelatin capsules, and they're pH-resistant. Uh, so anything in these capsules will bypass your stomach and get released to the small bowel if everything works just fine. So you can buy 500 of these for 20 bucks and buy one of these little uh, sort of uh, $20, $25 devices that you put all the capsules in, you can just fill them up with bicarbonate, add a lid, and then you can make your own enteric-coated bicarbonate, uh, which is way cheaper uh, and can make a real improvement in your quality of life if you're one of these people that burps or has a lot of GI distress. If you're also someone who has bicarbonate issues, you can neutralize the stomach acid, and that might reduce the symptoms because it's the stomach acid that converts the bicarbonate to gas. So you can neutralize the stomach acid with an H2 blocker like famotidine, proton pump blocker like metoprazole and percocet. But this needs stomach acid. So if you're doing that, you have to remember that you might actually be making ProSysby not work properly. So with ProSysby, which is the delayed release cystiamine, it's regular old cystodon cystiamine with a pH-dependent coating. And that coating hopefully stays intact in the stomach, and then once the pellets move down into your small bowel and the pH changes to alkaline, the pellets release. And so that's the reason why, as uh, 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 Lars said earlier, your your uh, Insurance company is spending $200,000 a year for ProSysby. If you ever open up one of the pills, you see the granules are various different sizes and shapes. It's not because it's cheap manufacture. It's because the different sizes provide some delayed release effect. So some release quicker, some take longer to release. So you can sustain 12-hour dose. So if you're taking antacids, you're going to shut down stomach acid. Or if you have advanced chronic kidney disease or urine dialysis, you might have not enough stomach acid or ha you have delayed gastric cancer. All those causes the process to, be, to become more like cystic gum, and it can be painful, discomforting, and you can have odor. So one of the first things I recommend in people who are having trouble with process B is to ensure that there's enough acid in the stomach when they swallow the process B. Make sure you're not taking bicarbonate or calcium within a couple of hours. Try taking the ProSysby with a source of acid, like lemon juice diluted one to five with water, or fruit juice, or dark colas, because Coke and Pepsi are acidic. Ask any dentist about seeing all the tooth enamel uh, dissolve uh, in people that drink a lot of Coke. All those things are acid. All those things will help the ProSysby granules stay intact until they get to your small bottle. Adults. Many patients who have a cast iron stomach as a child or teenager become much more sensitive to ProSysby once they hit their 30s. A lot of adults complain that they seem to be having more problems with cystine therapy, and especially with ProSysby. They get abdominal pain, they get bloating, and a lot of them complain that the odor is getting worse, and it affects socialization and their job. So many adults I talk to have because they have to, because they need to keep the job, they reduce their dose. 
Maybe they don't take their morning dose at all. Maybe they take their first dose, first dose after work. So it's like four or something, and then they take their evening dose because they're both together. Maybe they just give up because they believe if you don't do it right, it ain't worth doing at all. Well, don't give up. Even a small amount of cysteine depleting therapy is beneficial and better than nothing. So just going back, this is data on kidney function. So on the x-axis along there, that's the age of the child in years. And on the y-axis, that's the kidney function, the GFR normal being above 100. Okay. Now this first line here, this is the deterioration of kidney function in people that were never given cysteine depleting therapy. This is the pre-cystagon era or parts of the world where there's no cystagon available. So fast deterioration of kidney function. So they're all on dialysis or passed away by the time they're early teens. With a small amount of cysteine depleting therapy, not well tolerated or not well adhered to, it delays things. The kidney function is better and it takes longer to progress to kidney failure. If you take patients who are diagnosed young, who have good adherence because their parents are uh, uh, Marines, ex-Marines, or they just are, are wonderful kids, their kidney function is better and is preserved for much longer. Now, if you take that special population who has, they're born after an older sibling has cystinosis, and so they're diagnosed within a few weeks of life, and they're started on cystine depleting therapy right away, like we've had, I, I, we've had uh, the, the example of uh, Lars's second child, and uh, one of the children that, uh, uh, Dr. Midgley was talking about, their kidney function is preserved even better. So we know even a little bit of cysteine depleting therapy helps. But the more, the better. The earlier the start, the better. Uh, <clears throat> so even if you're taking it only once a day, don't give up. But say you're prescribed 15 pills every 12 hours, and you take those 15 pills and you're going to have a lot of discomfort, or you're going to have an odor that's hard on school or in high school or, or you're doing customer service. There's no rule that says you have to take the purses be only twice a day. More and more patients are finding that if they take maybe like six pills in the morning, they don't have the odor. So they might take six pills in the morning, six pills after work, so they get their morning dose that way, or six pills in the morning, nine pills after work, and then 15 at bed, right? And some of them just say, I'll just take three times a day. So that same 30 pills, but just 10, 10, 10. And that works for people. So there's no rule that says you can only take processes twice a day. And so if you find that a few less pills are better tolerated, that works. When you look at the curve of the, of the level of cysteamine in the blood, which is the upper red line, what I wanted to point out was this is 12 hours right here. So this is when we measure the trough, either cysteamine level or the white cell cysteine there. But you go back to 10 hours, nine, eight hours, it's all the same. So whether you take those pills three times a day every eight hours or twice a day every 12 hours, or it turns out that you have to, you can't take it 12 and 12 because of work or because you're in athletics. So you take one dose 10 hours apart and the next dose 14 hours apart. It doesn't matter. I regularly have parents who complain, you know, my child is on a seven and seven schedule, seven before school, seven in the evening. I send them off to basketball or music and they've got their pills in their pocket. They promise they're going to stop the basketball game and take it at seven at night. I'm washing the kids' uniform the next day and there's all the pills. Didn't take it at all. Take it before the game, 10 hours apart. Take it after the game. 14 hours apart, it's much better to get it in. And as you can see, the chemistry shows it doesn't really matter if you're eight or 14 hours, it's all the same, get it in. Delayed gastric emptying, this is the last time. Getting As people get older and they've gone through dialysis, dialysis and chronic kidney disease is associated with delayed gastric emptying. And so the normal gastric emptying for a child or adult is an hour and 15 minutes, it's 75 minutes, for 50% of the stomach content to be empty. In all of these patients who were 
on dialysis, they all had prolonged aftercare team time, three hours, four hours. What that means is pills in the food that you took two or three hours ago, a lot of them are still going to be there when you take your prosopia. So you get a transplant, your gastric emptying time gets better. But for many transplanted patients, it's still prolonged. And if you have diabetes, that also prolongs your gastric emptying time. What it means is this explains some of the reason why adults are having more trouble with prosopia as they get older and having more GI toxicity. Point we're starting to really focus on is going back to Dr. Gohill's original study that led to the development of delayed release prosopia. So this is a tube that was like 20 feet long that they got manufactured in Australia. And they brought in a bunch of cystinosis volunteers into the clinical research center. And the tube was placed in the nose, down into the stomach, and it had a weight on the end. Of it. So it, they just left it there and they would take an x-ray every once in a while and it moved into the small bowel and even into the large bowel. And this x-ray on the right here is there's the spine and then this is all the tube coiled all the way through the intestines. And so they were able to squirt in cystine and cystagon and see what the blood test showed and the symptoms at different parts of the intestine. At the end of the study, they pulled the thing out. It was really expensive, so they sterilized it and used it for the next patient. <clears throat> I know what they told me. Sorry, Ranjit, it had to come out sooner or later. But... What they showed was this is the blood level of the cystine. So whether you gave it into the stomach, the small bowel early on, like the, uh, the jejunum, the distal small bowel, like the ileum, or even into the cecum, which is part of the large bowel, it was absorbed by the blood. So going back to uh, uh, Dr. Midgley's comment about he had a friend who was looking at rectal administration of cystiamine, you, you know, they sort of met in the middle where you could give it rectally or you could just give it through the small tube. The point is it's absorbed all along the intestines. But patients really only have pain if the cystiamine is given into the stomach. So if you have delayed release prosystemia and it's working and your stomach is acid and it empties properly, that cystine isn't seen by your stomach because it's released into the small bowel. But as we get older, as our intestines slow down, as we might be on dialysis or have diabetes, you just can't rely on prosystine to work. And many patients are giving up on cystine free therapy because of quality of life issues. And we rediscovered giving it directly into the jejunum. So I have three or four patients now where they, they, we're having all these problems, and we worked with their GI team to put in a jejunostomy. So it's a surgical procedure where there's a little hole made into the stomach, and a tube is threaded through the stomach into the duodenum and into the jejunum, and the tube just lives there. And they go back to cystagon, and they squirt it in as a liquid three times a day, four times a day, and it's been life-changing because the symptoms are markedly reduced and they're able to maintain cystine treating therapy to prevent the muscle weakness, hopefully for many, many more years. So, you know, you started two fees as an infant, and then you saw the pictures of people with their tubes removed and they're doing well. But once they hit old age, old age, geez, I'm, I'm 64, so, so 40 is young, but once you hit your 40s or your 30s, especially if you have diabetes, dialysis, we are starting to think maybe that might help you get your system depleting therapy well to keep you healthy, keep your muscles working well into old age so that cystinosis patients can, can collect social security. All right, that's it. Thank you.